This is that nice Tolkien song. The only Tolkien song I will ever write, I think. great commotion from the lonely mountain back to the shire the hobbits are sneaking the one ring from the frying pan into the fire from somewhere we gotta get a hero that's what the bards all sing but they never expected the rock and it rolling up ring it's the return of the king <laughs> i got a suit of studded black leather and my hair stays in place of course I got a reforged steel electric guitar and a 300 horsepower horse. No matter what I ask my rangers, they'll do almost anything. Well, well, and the ladies are waiting for the chance to dance and sing at the return of the king. Well, everyone said that I was dead or maybe ever going off to hide. But I just kicked back to get on track and wait till I hit my stride. I got my rangers hopping down the misty, murky Morai line. And there ain't gonna be no stopping until the Pelennor fields are mine. We'll hold off the trolls and goblins and all of the rocks they fling until Sam and Frodo said golem's bells to ring and make me the king. Now I'm supposed to marry Arwen, the fairy queen of the Saturday nights. But until then, give me A-O-N and I'll blow out her northern lights. We'll have a celebration and I'll take a couple of years to rest. And I'll stick around and keep an eye on things till everybody else heads west. But I'll be here if you need me, summer, fall, winter, or spring. And everyone in Middle Earth will really rock and swing. At the return of the king, at the return of the king, at the return of the king. Why they call me the king. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was The Return of the King, uh huh, by Tom Smith. <laughs> Thank you, Creative Commons. You know, it made me think, like, what would have happened if Mel Brooks had made an adaptation of Lord of the Rings? I don't know why. Or, you know, like Weird Al. Like, I, don't, I was trying to think, like, has Weird Al done any Lord of the Rings related songs? All, all I can think of is the Leonard Nimoy song about Bill Blow Baggins. But, you know. Okay. Welcome back to Geek Channel 8. I'm Eric. I'm Johanna. I'm David. I'm Rosie. What have you been watching lately, Rosie? I'm telling you, if if you want something that's crass, full of blood, guts, and gore, and has superheroes, you got to watch The Boys. You got to watch The Boys. It is so action packed. Um, my uh, partner DVR'd it. We can't ever seem to watch it on the same schedule because he's a bartender and I have a day job. So, um, you know, we record it and then we watch it on our own time and the last episode that I had watched, which I'm not going to say which one, I just think y'all should watch it. Um, but the last episode I watched, I could not fast forward through the commercials fast enough. It was just so good. So highly recommend. Um, and uh, I did finish up the final season of Stranger Things. Freaking love that. Uh, Eddie Munson forever. Yeah. <laughs> love so, him. So I'm currently watching season four of stranger things so i don't know how it ends yet okay i won't um, say a word so i just watched the the episode where dustin tells eddie like you gotta you gotta trust me are, are you gonna follow me and he's he he says you're asking me to walk into mordor with you yes <laughs> the shy the shire is burning so i guess I'll walk into Mordor with you or whatever. So yeah. <laughs> perfect timing for what we're doing today. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, before we get into that, Thal, uh, let's get a background to the year. The uh, Lord of the Rings Return of the King came out in 2003. So that's the year we're focusing on today. Um, that was a pretty important year because that was when the war on Iraq started. That's the year that we found Saddam Hussein and he was killed um and uh you know the 
<laughs> weapons of mass destruction were never found. Um, <laughs> but, you know, eh, that was also the year that the final Volkswagen Beetle rolled off the line in Mexico. Rest in peace, Volkswagen Beetle, my favorite vehicle of all time. Um, some great movies that came out that year. The Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, Finding Nemo, uh, Matrix Reloaded, Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl, Bruce Almighty. Still love that movie today. The Last Samurai, Term Terminator 3, Matrix Revolutions came out that year too. X2, X-Men, United, Bad Boys 2, Lost in Translation, um, some popular musicians that year, Elton John, I mean, duh, Beyonce, duh, Christina Aguilera, duh, but some other ones that, you know, we may or may not have forgotten about, um, David Gray, loved his music, Limp Bizkit, Evanescence, Coldplay is still around making music, Nora Jones, um, let's see, Madonna was still doing pretty good that year, Avril Lavigne, which she's kind of made a comeback this year, um, Let's see Kelly Clarkson, she's still around. You know, now she's got a TV show. Uh, Fleetwood Mac was pretty popular that year. Ashanti, if anybody remembers Ashanti, her music was amazing. Harley Davidson, they celebrated their 100 year anniversary that year. Um, tens of thousands of Harley owners gathered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin to celebrate. Italy suffered a countrywide blackout and UK suffered the highest temperatures ever recorded. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Johanna, what about the production notes for this film? Since we started this episode with a little bit of Lord of the Rings themed music, it seems fair to wrap up our series with a discussion of Howard Shore's remarkable score for this trilogy. Howard Shore has won three Academy Awards in his career. Two of them were for Return of the King, and one of them was for Fellowship. He's done 46 soundtrack credits total, but his big wins have come from his work on Lord of the Rings. Actually, fun fact, uh, he won um, an Oscar for Best Original Score for Fellowship of the Ring. He did not win for Two Towers because at the time there was a rule that you couldn't win Best Original Score if it was for a sequel soundtrack. And then they changed that rule specifically so he could win again for Return of the King. So woo to Howard Shore. Wait a minute. You couldn't win for a sequel? So basically it's not an original score if it's recycling some of the same themes from another film. So that was the argument previously that, you know, the Two Towers soundtrack was not an original score or whatever. And then they changed their minds because the work is really remarkable and there is some reorchestration for, for each film. And so they changed the rule so that he could win again for Return of the King. Also won for Best Original Song for, for that film. So three Oscars in total for Howard Shore, all of them for Lord of the Rings. His score involves a hundred different light motifs, like actually like even a total of like 160 light motifs. If you count, you know, some of the stuff he later brought into the Hobbit, uh, if you count that within the same Lord of the Rings world, one of the things I found really cool, uh, reading into his process, he actually started working on the score before he saw any of the footage that they were doing on set. So these themes are based upon the books. And I think that accounts for how, you know, I, I don't know about you, David, but when I am watching Lord of the Rings, the music is a huge part of my feeling that they got it right. And I think the fact that Howard Shore started with the books instead of with the footage of the films accounts for this, you know, feeling, this, this authentic, you know, Tolkien kind of feeling to the music. Uh, they actually chose Howard Shore because they had been using Braveheart and Last of the Mohicans soundtracks for um, their test tracks with the footage. So they, they called on Howard Shore. He decided that he wanted to treat the composition as an epic opera with massive choruses and orchestras. He chose a neo-romantic 19th century style, sort of like if anyone is familiar with Karl Orff's Carmina Burana with some really interesting inter instrumentation, a lot of timpani, <laughs> a lot of chorus, a uh, really interesting use of language also in Carmina Burana, which is reflected in how Howard Shore approached this score. 
there's a lot of Tolkien language infused directly into the the vocal pieces, which actually, you know, this the score stands out for having quite a lot more singing than a lot of other movie soundtracks. Uh, they use this kind of Sprechzimmer uh, approach to like almost a, a chanting of of this Tolkien language, especially thinking about you know, moments when the evil characters like the Nazgul are coming on to attack and that, you know, the chorus plays a huge role in that. Uh, in keeping with this operatic vision, um, Shore used three different scripts and the book to write the themes and he ended up putting four years of work into this. Normally, Someone who's writing a film score would take maybe six to eight weeks for a film. So four years is quite quite a lot more time to spend on it. Some, some other things that are just kind of interesting about this. Um, it was mostly recorded with the London Philharmonic, but there are a few parts that are done by like a local New Zealand orchestra. And even though it's mostly these huge, you know, orchestra moments there are a few other like little bands that kind of get fit in so it's it's a pretty complex work what what also makes it unique is that for most film scores the music is designed to emphasize the mood of what's going on with Howard Shore's score it also underscores the plot of what's happening and so that the themes are not just tied to like oh, the Shire feels happy and I'm supposed to feel happy right now. Or, you know, when you're watching a Marvel movie and the music is telling you exactly how you're supposed to feel about what's happening. With Howard Shore's Lord of the Rings score, it's much more like now the characters are in danger and the music is telling me like this is the motif for when the Nazgul are going to attack or this is the motif for when the Urukai are coming. Like... I mean, it's almost more like the score for Star Wars in that way, where the, the leitmotifs are tied directly to characters and to the action that's happening. The fact that we can come away from, from this soundtrack humming specific moments and that it calls the scene directly to mind uh, is, is a huge credit to, to Howard Shore's vision for this. And his Oscars, I think, were well-deserved. All right, that was what I was most excited to talk about today. But I also feel like since this is called Return of the King, should mention a little bit about the king, Aragorn. Uh, I think in an earlier episode, we hinted that Daniel Day-Lewis was one of the early front runners for this part. You know, maybe they thought they were making Last of the Mohicans again. Like there seems to, that seems to be coming up as a theme here, but... Um, Apparently, Daniel Day-Lewis had absolutely no interest in this. Peter Jackson kept calling and calling. Like, Peter Jackson really wanted him to be in it. And Daniel Day-Lewis was like, I don't think I'd want to see this film. So I don't think I want to be in this film. And as it turns out, you know, I think it would have been a total disaster if Daniel Day-Lewis had been in this. His method acting thing, like... He would have been out there, you know, like hunting orcs in his spare time. They never would have been able to get the guy back to set. He would have spoken only in Elvish. It would have been a whole mess. Um, and Viggo Mortensen, I think, ended up being perfect for the role. He, uh, Viggo Mortensen did get injured a couple times on set and nobly fought through it. Uh, you know, stubbed a few toes, you know, fell off a horse here and there. But, um, and apparently, you know, Viggo Mortensen, despite not having, you know, a full method approach, uh, still got into the character, you know, didn't notice at times that people were calling him Aragorn instead of by his real name. He just like, you know, once you live in a character for 18 months shooting, I imagine it gets harder and harder to remember where you end and the character begins. Other uh, actors who were considered uh, Russell Crowe and Vin Diesel. Really glad that we got Viggo Mortensen instead. Yeah, I think Viggo Mortensen is one of the assets of this film. Everybody is great in this film. I don't think there's anyone that's bad in it, but he is particularly good. And in addition to being exactly the way that I pictured Aragorn, he was a fan of the books. And in fact, there was a 
interview Empire Magazine did with him where he said, quote, I'd like to have seen what Peter Jackson would have done with the character Gonbury Gon, the chief of the Druidane, wild men of the Druidan forest. Seeing him lead King Theoden and his army of Rohirrim through the forest to join the fight to save Minas Tirith would have been thrilling. Now, that there is someone who is a fan of the books, and I think I'm glad they went with him instead of, you know, a then known marquee name actor. Well, that was something, you know, that came up as a theme with all the casting. Like they very specifically didn't want to choose superstar actors. They ended up gravitating towards people who were going to define these roles and weren't coming with a ton of baggage. Like Bruce Willis at one point was considered for Boromir. And you just like, you can't even imagine that. But like what you can't imagine is like seeing anyone other than John McClane play it's like Bruce Willis playing John McClane playing Boromir and so they they did a great job of choosing actors who didn't have a lot of other characters that they were dragging around with them but they also chose people who were willing to move to New Zealand for 18 months and that's a short list of people so um so I think you know all of the the folks came with a certain level of dedication just because they were willing to you know put their career otherwise on hold and uproot their families, their lives in order to do this project. Yeah, it may be one of the reasons why we see so many Australian actors here, because they were sort of nearby. In fact, I think Fran Walsh said that she or Peter Jackson kept every scrap of paper that ever uh, went into this. And way back from the very beginning, there was one actor they knew they wanted, an Australian actress Kate Blanchett to be Galadriel. It's the one casting they had decided way in advance. But she's by no means the only Australian actor here. We've already talked about Hugo Weaving in the past, and there's some others like John Noble, for example, as Denethor. He's really great in this, though. And so this this harkens back to, you know, the number of times that I saw the Rankin and Bass Return of the King relative to the number of times that I had read the book relative to the number of times that I'd seen this movie. And watching this film again, I realized how how well they handled that storyline, which is not not a happy part of the story. And, you know, it's it's kind of interesting how this theme shows up in the hobbit and in two towers and here but this theme of like the old failing leader who's like trying to hold on to you know outdated ideas or like a fixed vision of things that is poisoning their way of of looking at at what's going on so that they can't see their responsibility towards the other pe- towards everyone else they can only see their own like their own kingship, their own legacy, you know, can't see past their own nose. And this character type shows up in a couple places in Lord of the Rings, but I feel like Denethor is really, really the one and that John Noble gets it, gets it more right than the others. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Okay, it is time for supper. Last time we had dinner, and that would normally be the largest meal. But as I said last time, we are going to make supper the largest meal because this is the longest movie. I could have gone with a few different things. I think we saw people feasting on a leg of pheasant or turkey or something in this, you know, that's your classic Renfest feast. But the salted pork is particularly good, 
as Pippin told us. The medieval food of choice, suckling pig. Now, I've mentioned before how I'm a fan of the joy of cooking. One of the reasons is because of recipes like this that you can find in there. And I'm just going to read directly from the joy of cooking. Sorry for all our foreign listeners, but uh, I don't know the centigrade for this. So you preheat the oven to 450 degrees. Dress by drawing or scraping as for opossum. See page 515 in The Joy of Cooking, the original Joy of Cooking. And cleaning as for rabbit. Now, we told you how to clean and dress rabbit last time, so I'm not going to go into that this time. Remove the eyeballs and lower the lids. The dressed pig should weigh about 12 pounds. Fill it with onion dressing or stuffing for crown roast or pork. It takes two and a half quarts of dressing to stuff a pig this size. Multiply all your ingredients, but not the seasonings. Use these sparingly until dressing is combined, then taste it and add what is lacking. Sew up the pig. Put a block of wood in its mouth to hold it open. Skewer the legs into position, pulling fore legs forward and bending hind legs into a crouching stance, and then rub the pig with oil or soft butter and a cut clove of garlic if you want. Dredge it with flour. Cover ears and tail with aluminum foil. Place the pig in a pan, uncovered in the oven for 15 minutes, then reduce the heat to 325 degrees and roast until tender, allowing 30 minutes to the pound. Baste every 15 minutes with pan drippings or additional vegetable oil if necessary. Remove foil from ears and tail before serving. Place the pig on a platter. Remember, last time I told you to save a potato. I know it's traditional to see the roast pig depicted with an apple in its mouth, but I prefer a potato. So that's why we had you save a potato from last time. Remove wood from mouth and replace it with the potato. Place in the eyes raisins or cranberries. Drape around the neck a wreath of small green leaves or garnish the platter or board with watercress. The pig may be surrounded with cinnamon apples, apples stuffed with sweet potatoes, apples stuffed with mincemeat, or tomatoes florentine. Then, make pan gravy. To carve, place head to left of carver. Remove four legs and hams. Divide meat down center of back. Separate the ribs. And last but not least, serve a crackling portion of skin to each person. You know, when you started this, I was afraid you were going to say, you know, classic dish from the middle ages mutton <laughs> i was like no <laughs> no please <laughs> i'll throw out that whole roast pig uh roasted outside a slow roasted over a fire was fairly common where i grew up for high school graduation parties so that tells you rural northern ohio was in the middle ages back in the 1980s so Okay, you want to talk about Schmeagol? You want to talk about the, the flashback? Flashback Gollum doesn't look like present day Gollum. Oh, yeah. So it, this is actually relevant to, you know, Two Towers and, and my discussion of Andy Circus. But they had originally done Gollum as an animated character without the motion capture. And so the Gollum you see in Fellowship of the Ring is not Andy Circus, And... I think because they were doing a lot of this simultaneously, there are other parts where Gollum is not the same Gollum as you see in Two Towers, who is mostly Andy Serkis. But they had like d spent two years creating Gollum as an animated character and then changed their mind and then had like two and a half months to like quick, <laughs> like redo the whole thing as a motion capture Gollum. So that if you notice a difference, that's why. The final point is still not the final golem that we see, so that's that's still 
Gollum is continuing to evolve or maybe devolve, degrade uh, in his addiction to the ring. So I, I think what they're showing us at the end of that scene is just, you know, one point in that uh, further uh, de-evolution. Uh, but I love the ending of that scene where, and somebody email in and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it is actually Andy Circus in makeup. And then they, he shuts his eyes, and when he opens his eyes, it's clearly the CG uh, Gollum eyes superimposed over Andy Circus in makeup. And that switch in that blink of the eye from uh, a, a physical being to the, to the CGI Gollum, I, I've always loved that little bit there. I think we should also mention that Andy Circus, in addition to having one of the greatest performances in this series, his transformation from Schmeagel to Gollum, I think rivals that of Lon Chaney Sr.'s transformation from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde in terms of performance. But in addition to that, he was also a second unit director on these films. So uh, there is a non-small amount of filming that uh, was done with... Andy Serkis as the director. So his impact on these films is huge. I'd say he's also an unsung hero of 13 going on 30, but now you'll all shoot me daggers with your eyes. Because <laughs> 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 there you see his Michael Jackson dance moves. I mean, multi-talented. Yes, clearly. <laughs> so what was the meaning of Theoden and Eowyn's exchange at the party this is the one where he's basically like women should stay home and leave the fighting to the men is it that exchange well that's part of it that's the end of it but there's a lot more to it than that i think part of that exchange is also the like you could do a lot worse than aragorn kind of conversation where he's like very not subtle about like that one that's who you should go for and it's like we've already been over this aragorn is not interested I would say this is more physically and geographically, but Jackson has overly complicated this part of the story. where And, and this starts in Two Towers, the, the Rohan part of the story, where um, uh, when they leave Edoras for Helm's Deep, the women and the children and the citizens go directly to Dunharo, the, the mountain uh, location where they, they bring all their troops in Return of the King. So that's where Eowyn goes. She doesn't even go to Helm's Deep. And then they, they meet her there. And there is a little bit of the, uh, you know, no, women shouldn't be going directly into battle. But I need somebody that I could trust who could lead the last remnant of the people if it comes to that. And I recognize you as the best battle commander should that happen. But you're not going to the main battle. No, of course not. So to some extent, there's a whole lot of motion in Rohan between uh, the movies Two Towers and Return of the King that I think is needlessly complex geographically uh, by Jackson's adaptation. The other exchange that I didn't quite get was between Gandalf and Pippin at the party. So Gandalf and Pippin have this, you know, relationship where Gandalf is constantly riding his ass. He's like, fool of a took, you know. And then uh, Gandalf has these other sayings like, as the Nazgul flies. And uh, there is another time where he's talking to Pippin and he says, it's better if you didn't speak at all. Yeah. So there's all those times he's looking at Pippin and saying these odd lines. But then there's another time at this party where he just gives him this look and, and they show Gandalf looking at Pippin and Pippin looking at Gandalf. And I didn't quite get what the heck that exchange was supposed to be all about. Well, Pippin is being tempted to look into the Palantir and Gandalf's picking up on that. And Gandalf doesn't want him to look in the Palantir because then Gandalf doesn't want his plans revealed to Sauron, uh, who he knows is watching that Palantir. So um, in, in the books, that actually happens at the end of the two towers in the book, and it happens much more quickly after Isengard. Again, there's all this needless travel from this place to this place to that place. Pippin basically does that that night after while they're camping out outside Isengard uh, when, when that takes place. So this is a good time to bring up 
you know, I did some research because I wanted to see, oh, is there an interesting story about how they managed to convince folks that they should film The Lord of the Rings in New Zealand? I mean, we've talked about landscape porn. There seems like a lot of good reasons to do it. There's also, you know, you can film beautiful vistas without there being cities or whatever that you have to crop out. Kind of makes sense. But one thing that the fans have pointed out is that the landscape is all wrong and that this means that there ends up being a lot of unnecessary travel or like the geography doesn't quite make sense or also that the geography is too beautiful. One of the main problems is that Middle Earth is described as being this kind of like drab, run down, there's ruins everywhere and that there's this kind of old feeling, this old decaying feeling that's part of what needs to have this rebirth with the new king coming to revitalize, you know, civilization and that that's missing in New Zealand. New Zealand feels like totally virgin territory, which I think, you know, as viewers, we're like, this means it's a different place. It's not 20th century Earth. It's some other place. But at the same time, I wonder if it creates inconvenient story situations like what you're describing, David, where it just like seems to take forever to get places. <laughs> I think part of what I'm talking about is this idea of let's film as much as we can and different give ourselves options within the editing room. Could do stuff outside of Isengard. We could do stuff in Edoras. We could do stuff at Dunharrow. Let's film as much as we can and then figure it out in editing is, is what I how I take that. Uh, but there are geographic mistakes, uh, and this is going back to Two Towers, where Legolas says they're turning northeast. And I'm like, no, by the very map you show us later in the movie, turning northeast would be going backwards. They're going northwest. And, and those dialogue geographic mistakes, I'm just like, come on, look at a map while you're saying that, Orlando Bloom. <laughs> Point out that it's wrong. <laughs> so... Um, but that could be that in the place that they are, you know, it was northeast for them, uh, even though that didn't make sense in Middle Earth. I would say the White Mountains that are the north-south boundary between Gondor and Rohan are supposed to be very dramatic. And any artist who's depicted them, they're very dramatic, very gorgeous mountains uh, that we see in the movies as well. And that you wouldn't find in England, most importantly. That you wouldn't find in England, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So I noticed that when Gandalf arrives in Gondor with Pippin, Denethor calls him by his elvish name. Denethor calls Gandalf Mithrandir. Was this a mistake? Because it seems odd that he would be using Gandalf's elvish name. I don't believe that's a mistake. The Gondorians were always more comfortable with elvish names. They might not have been using elvish language anymore. Uh, but they all still had elvish formal names, especially the stewards and the royalty when royalty was there. And Gandalf at some point says that he's known by Gandalf in the north of Middle-earth. And Gondor's sort of like middle south of Middle-earth. So um, I think Mithrandir is, is not a mistake there. Next question. Faramir's last stand we see in this movie, but I do not remember this from the book. Is that correct? He does get wounded, and I believe he does does write out. Now, my problem with that scene is, do they not have any military scientists at all, or are they just going to line up as one large shooting gallery to all get shot with bows and arrows? Um, like, no strategy whatsoever. Uh, we're not talking about Alexander the Great's famous flanking maneuver here with how Faramir <laughs> runs his, his army there. But I believe Faramir does ride out and gets wounded and has to be saved by, uh, uh, by coming back to, uh, to, to uh, Minas Tirith. So, so we're going to call it accurate, right? <laughs> That's going to require me to read the whole chapter of Siege of the Gondors. But, <laughs> but I know he, 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 is, he is in Minas Tirith and he gets sent back out and he gets wounded. So that, that is true. It might be a bigger scene in the movie than in the book, but there is some, some, some aspect to that. Next question, something I don't remember being in the book. What was the deal with Arwen's sickness? Yeah. I don't get it either. That's that's all Walsh Jackson Boyens making it up. Basically, she has said that she wants to marry Aragorn, and Elrond has given Aragorn the, I'll only let my daughter marry the king of Gondor. 
And so you better go do that thing now. But in terms of Arwen getting sick because of the ring and because of Sauron, that's that's in the movie. That's not in the books at all. Yeah, I was trying to figure out whether they were trying to use Arwen's sickness as a way to like heighten the stakes for Aragorn in terms of him needing to be the king. Like, mm -hmm. as if, you know, oh, I can't marry her unless this happens weren't enough, but that it's like a further push of like, oh no, like the stakes are really high, but I kind of feel like it's thoroughly unnecessary. You know, the entire fate of the world is hanging in the balance and whether Arwen dies because of it feels like kind of a footnote compared to Sauron returning. I know, right? And, and they could have kept most of the same story and just cut out that one or two lines. Um, we are eventually told that, you know, she chooses to live the life of a mortal and marry Aragorn. Uh, and we were told that, uh, sorry, spoiler alert to the very end, Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. That Frodo basically has her seat on the ship to the west. So there are things that she's sacrificing. There are ways that she is choosing mortality over immortality. Uh, but the book does not depict it as the all of a sudden she's got COVID or something. <laughs> so. And then she has that conversation with her dad. And her dad's like, no, you're going to go into the west. And she's like okay, I'm going to go into the West and just sort of follows the parade of elves through the forest to the boat that's going to take her away. I'm like, way to fight for your man, right? Yeah. But at, the, at this point in the movie, again, not in the book, in the movie, Aragorn has said, get on the ship and leave. Uh, I'm not interested in marrying you anymore. And she's like, no, take my jewel anyway. So they're, they're on a break, to use a friend's reference. <laughs> If they're on a break, let's talk about the Kinko's copy girl that he hooks up with, the manic right. pixie Rohirrim, <laughs> Eowyn. That's right. Eowyn, you know, she's marching with the rest of the soldiers, doing her best to fit in. She's got the helm on, and then she eventually has that confrontation with the Nazgul that we talked about in the animated series. I think this is one of the few places where the animated version of The Return of the King actually outdoes this live action one. The whole, when the Nazgul says, no man can harm me. And she flings off the helm and says, but no man am I. Yeah, I think some of it is just they changed the language around. Like, you know, they very deliberately took some of Eowyn's dialogue in the book that is like very flowery and like medieval knight confronting a dragon kind of language and then boiled it down to plain English. And to me, there's a huge difference between no man am I and I am no man. Like I am no man just falls kind of flat. It's like, okay, that's your comeback line. Like, all right, cool. But um, like, no man am I, you know, like the, the poetry of it, I think, is a big part of that moment. And this sort of callback to Gawain and the Green Knight, like that kind of level of, you know, fantasy lore and confrontation and like knighthood that Eowyn gets to participate in. And here you lose that with the, with cutting out the poetry. And not only is it a badass line, no man am I, but the other thing the animated series does is we see that she's getting ready to go off to war and then she's off stage for most of the time up until this scene with the Nazgul and so you forget about her just like everybody else so when she does finally throw off her helm and save the day it's like a much more of a surprise in the animated version I, I would say the animated version has the advantage of they're not showing her thinking about going to battle, arguing with her brother about it, talking about Mary going to battle, picking Mary up. And, and I, I've heard Jackson talk about that, and they just didn't feel that they could pull off Durnhelm as a man while Mary is sitting there with her and uh, uh, talking to her and stuff like that. And maybe that comes down to casting. Maybe they didn't think that everybody would instantly recognize Miranda Otto under that mask. Um, I, I don't know, but but Jackson felt that they couldn't pull it off, so they didn't try. <laughs> but I, I get the words are a very 
unfortunate difference between the two. I, I realize some of the some of the dialogue with the Witch King, it's like, why don't you just get down to fighting already? But some of the specific word choices could have been better in the in this adaptation. Speaking of getting down to fighting already, I was pleased to see that Gandalf finally gets around to sword fighting. I mean, he's been carrying Glamdring around ever since The Hobbit. It's about time he finally unsheathed the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the shark meter now there are no sharks but there is once again a giant spider and as we know johanna and rosie have a thing about giant spiders yes i hate them <laughs> and once again we have one and this time it almost does frodo in I remember the first time I watched this, I was like, oh God, don't let this be the end. He's got to take that ring all the way to the end. Like this can't be it. But once again, Samwise swoops in and freaking saves him and kills the spider in the process. You know, it took me watching this movie probably five times to figure out that the spider was the she that Gollum was talking about. So call me dense if you want, but <laughs> it took me that long to figure it out. So I give this one full shark point because they are kind of like land sharks, especially because of Shelob's sneak attack. Mm -hmm. But where does he get stung exactly? I mean, you see the stinger and it goes down and stings him somewhere below frame. But <laughs> he's still wearing the mithril shirt. We know that from when he gets captured by the orcs. So... Where did he get stung and why wasn't he protected by the mithril shirt? Eventually you do see a poisony looking wound uh, and it's up by his clavicle. And I have two thoughts on this and I don't know what's right or maybe neither of them are. One is mithril chainmail shirt uh, is not made for a hobbit. It's made for a young dwarf, but worn on a hobbit, it's, it's got a pretty uh, deep scoop neck on him. So it's possible that it hit above the scoop neck of the mithril or it's possible that the end of that stinger was smaller than the uh, rings of chainmail, and somehow foiled its way through. I'm going to go with A, but I also want to note that when I watched this with my son, that was his reaction also. He was like, what? But what about the mithril? He was, you know, all outraged. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm glad you mentioned Meet the Feebles, because watching Shelob is one of the times where, like, I felt that connection of, Okay, I can I can see how you go from Meet the Feebles to this film. And I think some of it is Shelob and that whole scene like disgust is a major feature of scenes like this in Lord of the Rings, which if you think about other fantasy films, it's not like they won't go into that disgust territory, but usually the disgust is also humorous. And here it felt more pure, like just like... She loved the spider, like the stickiness and the stinger and the mouth, like all of it is disgusting and so excellently disgusting as only the director of Meet the Feebles could achieve. <laughs> this is definitely all Peter Jackson, because when you read the book, when it describes Shelob or even Ungoliant, the mother of all spiders, it's more about evil than it is about anything gross. I don't recall when I was reading it thinking or being grossed out by anything with Shelob, but I do recall the evilness. So I think the gross part is entirely Peter Jackson. I would generally agree, yeah. I, I, I get a little bit of grossness from the Shelob scene in the book, but not, not Jackson level. <laughs> Oh, but I will say, I'll throw two more land sharks in. <laughs> the beasts, and I have no idea what they are, that are pulling the contraption for the uh, second battering ram, uh, Grand. Those big rhinoceros-looking beasts, I think, could be called land sharks as well. <laughs> okay, but while we're talking about big creatures, we never talked about the Oliphants in the last right. film. Oh my god! Like... That was one of the things that I was really excited to see rendered in film, the Oliphants and the Ents, which, you know, we really should have talked about in the last film also. But um, they did a great job with large creatures uh, in these last two films. The Oliphants, to me, are the imperial walkers of this. <laughs> They're totally at-ats. 
don't you mean the Imperial Walker scenes is the Oliphant scene from the book? <laughs> well, if you want to get technical, they're both, I think, supposed to be kind of like represent the same thing that Hannibal's elephants did. Yeah. Sort of this massive unexpected thing that the yeah. army is first encountering and people are climbing up it. Yeah. You know, that even happens in this. Right. Legolas climbs up one and shoots it in the head. And then, like, rides down the trunk and, like, jumps off. <laughs> well, well, I had never pictured them this large. I, I thought they were supposed to be a little bit larger than modern elephants, but not, like, four stories tall. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't think any artistic depiction I've ever seen before the movie depicts them this large. Yeah, I had seen some artistic depictions of them before, but nothing this big. Mm, right. What I did like is that Jackson and Philippa and Fran, they sort of fleshed out the dialogue during all this battle stuff. Right. Even in the books, Gimli and Legolas are competing to see who can kill more during the big battle. And... You know, after Legolas goes through this elaborate thing to kill the Oliphant, you know, climbing up it and getting on its head, shooting in the head and sliding down the trunk and everything. And then Gimli says at the end, that still only counts as one. Yes. A shout out to the extended edition here. The extended edition shows Eowyn and Mary and even uh, Aragorn, Gimli and Legolas uh, doing a lot more battle. And not that I'm looking towards gore and stuff like that, but it just... I think that extended edition edit of the battle is far more satisfying than the theatrical edition of it. Especially for Eowyn. You get to actually like see her doing things before the Nazgul. Okay, so let's talk about a part of the movie that a lot of people are confused by. Mm -hmm. Aragorn's appeal to the spectral dead. What was going on there? So um, they were, this, this is one of these mountain tribes, one of these indigenous people uh, that Gondor is <laughs> kicking out of their lands. Uh, but they had sworn an allegiance to Isildur to come and fight Sauron in that final battle that we see in the opening of Fellowship of the Ring. And then they actually betray them and turn against them. So Isildur somehow puts on some sort of major curse on them. I don't know the mechanics or how that works. Uh, and they're, they're living in, in the cave and in the mountain holler as ghosts for all eternity until an era of Isildur can come and help them redeem themselves. This scene is a little bit weak. It's where things get a little bit too goonies for me because at one point they're, you know, climbing up mountains of skulls. Like, who stacked all the skulls there? And, you know, it's just a little cheesy. And, and, and if the fighting at Pelennor Fields is better in the extended edition, the skulls don't appear at all in the theatrical edition, and I think that's better there. <laughs> <laughs> Could, can, can I go back to the, the uh, scrubbing bubble ghosts uh, for a, while, a second here? Because this is one of the things I wanted to talk about. Part of Aragorn's story in the book is that, yes, he, he fulfills this prophecy of uh, bringing the army of the dead, but he actually doesn't bring them to Minas Tirith. He uses them and he uses his squad of super rangers from the north that are also not in the movie uh, because instead of Elrond, the people that come are the sons of Elrond and like all of his kin from the north that are like a super squad of Aragorns, special forces of Middle Earth. Um, and they, they go through the central part of Gondor and it's, Gondor isn't helpless like is shown in this movie. It's that they are being attacked on multiple fronts. And what Aragorn and the Army of the Dead and his super squad of Dúnedain are doing are they're going through and they're liberating all the towns in Gondor and sweeping up an, a large army behind them. And so the final battle with the Army of the Dead is at, is at the boats. Uh, and he actually releases them after they win the, the boats in the port city. And then he gets the Army of Gondor. So he's marshalling the Army of Gondor and coming up to Minas Tirith. Uh, and so that that's very different in the movie where where you don't see him marshalling any army except for the ghosts and they all come to Minas Tirith. And a big part in Tolkien's vision of this of the, of the battle is that Minas Tirith actually is not penetrated by any enemy except for the Witch King and only momentarily when he's confronted by Gandalf. And other than that, no enemy sets foot in Minas Tirith. 
Uh, but here in this adaptation, the bad guys have like half the city until the scrubbing bubbles come and just magically wipe them away. And so I have problems with the Army of the Dead in this movie. I'm not sure how I would adapt it differently because a lot of what I just told you is told in flashback after the battle. But then that builds suspense for the battle, so I'm not sure how I would do it. But uh, uh, maybe Eric would <laughs> have some ideas about that. But, but you miss this idea of Aragorn liberating Gondor, marshalling the army, and bringing the armies of Gondor to save the capital city. Well, I, for my part, I would have chosen to make the Army of the Dead more like the Pirates of the Caribbean undead with, you know, mostly skeleton. Like, mm -hmm. I would have gone that direction rather than the green Ghostbusters ghost version. Um, that's just me. <laughs> right. I think when you see that scene, there's definite comparisons to be made with Pirates of the Caribbean. This was this was first, though. This franchise was first. Yeah. But the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie came out before The Return of the King. This third film came out. Yeah. After the things having to do with the ghost army, my next biggest nitpick mm -hmm. is with the character of mm -hmm. Denethor not being fleshed out enough and some of his motivations are weird and unclear. Mm -hmm. For example, at one point he's like, Rohan has deserted us. And I'm like, no, they haven't. You never summoned them. Like the whole lighting of the fires on the mountain peaks was done behind his back. And then later on, Denethor's suicide just doesn't seem like there was enough leading up to it. It's kind of like suddenly he decides he's going to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. I disagree. I actually think it's, it, it, I mean, they should have been faithful to the books, of course, but um, the choice, the choice of showing that Denethor was driven to suicide because of the death of his two sons, but particularly like his feeling of responsibility for the death of his second son and that that was what like nail in the coffin that's what really drove him mad faramir yeah faramir i don't know if i'd buy that because at no time does he seem to care about faramir at all no no but, but... no i think that's the whole point is that he's like carrying that around inside and that like his grief over the loss of boromir like is making him realize you know that you know, he d he's not handling that grief well. He's directing that anger and that pain at Faramir, sort of expecting, like, you know, you should have done something to stop me from feeling this pain. Faramir takes it very personally. And then only too late, Denethor realizes, like, what he's done. You know, that he realizes he directed that pain at his surviving son that he should have cherished. And it kills him. And, and I'll point out there were at least three different characters who at various points tell Faramir that... Denethor would realize that Faramir was a good guy before it ended all. Boromir told him that. Gandalf told him that. I think Pippin tells him that. So, you know, we as the audience should know that Denethor is going to realize that he loves Faramir before the end of it all. I, I would also go back to my previous statement that, you know, the movie kind of depicts Gondor as somewhat helpless by this point, And maybe Denethor's guilt is also over how weak and helpless Gondor apparently is in this version of the story. And so, and I agree with you, you know, the madness is brought on by what Sauron's showing him in the Palantir in the books, uh, but I think it's a good adaptation not to confuse us all with too many Palantir, you know, who doesn't have a Palantir at that point, you know, and, <laughs> and who's talking to who when, but it also does leave this gap of, well, how does uh, uh, Denethor know about Aragorn? You know, so there, there's that kind of gaps in knowledge as well that uh, were explained by the Palantir that, that here you don't know where Denethor gets his information from. So let me talk for a minute about sort of an abstract problem I have with all of the versions of The Lord of the Rings, which is that there is, in these stories too much of an emphasis on the destruction of the one ring because there are all these other battles like the battle of helm's deep and the battle of the pelinor fields and stuff like that and those battles matter when they emphasize you know frodo's journey and the destruction of the ring so much 
it seems like, well, why even bother having all these other battles? All we got to do is make sure we get that ring destroyed. And so in my head canon, I like to think of Sauron as an existential threat with a great plan to take over Middle Earth. And the One Ring is a key part of his plan, but it is not all of his plan and he doesn't need it to succeed. He can still succeed in conquering Middle Earth the old fashioned way with armies. You know, it's just the One Ring is his quickest route to victory. But all these battles matter because if he wins militarily, he can still take over Middle Earth with or without the One Ring. I, I get that, and I, and I, I can halfway agree. I would say, and not to bring too much Stephen King into this discussion, but I think Tolkien's point and the whole the Battle of Pelennor Fields, you have these army of evil men or enslaved men and evil orcs and trolls and Nazgul. Uh, and who's fighting them is a whole bunch of humans, two half-elves, one elf, one dwarf, two hobbits, and one wizard who's always distracted. But it's basically humans claiming, no, this is the birth of the age of humans over the birth of the age of orc. And I, I think in Tolkien's view, the idea is that good took a stand. You know, you, you stood up to it and, and you battled this and, and you had this major victory. And yes, there's this larger existential threat that's still out there. But even then, we're going to take a stand uh, to, to um, delay the inevitable, uh, to distract the Sauron so that this other thing can happen. But, but we humans took a stand at the Battle of Pelennor Fields, and, and we were victorious there. And then going into something that's not in the movie, the fact that the, the actual final stroke of the uh, War of the Ring happens at the doorstep of Bag End in the book is also showing that yet you know we still have to battle evil where we find it in our homes as well is also part of it, part of that point too so I, I i see your point and that definitely if the ring wasn't destroyed sauron would have just been more slowly about his his takeover of middle earth but the the the, the humans took a stand to say no we are going to fight this evil so just to tag into that, I think this is actually at the end of Two Towers, but, you know, chronologically, maybe that's actually in Return of the King or or in the middle of Two Towers. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but Sam says something almost exactly to this effect of there's some good in this world and it's worth fighting for. And then he talks about, you know, all the legends and stories of great mm -hmm. heroes and that they're all stories about how people had a chance to turn back and didn't. And, you know, I think that that is a, a theme of this, like taking the stand is what matters. OK, I think that means I need to take a stand and I'm going to take a stand and say that this episode of the podcast is over. So if you liked what you heard, please tell somebody else about it. Spread the word about the podcast. That's the best way that you can help us out. Another way you can help us out is by going to Apple iTunes and giving us a good rating on there. Like and subscribe on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. If you want to reach us, you can reach us at GC8 Podcast. That's letter G, letter C, number eight, podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Eric. This is Johanna. This is Rosie. This is David. Signing off. Hold on. Let me just pull up the character list because my brain just sucks, Eric. My brain sucks. My parents met at a Cheech and Chong concert, so I can't remember shit most of the time. <laughs> did your parents really meet at a Cheech and Chong? <laughs> they really did. True story. My parents met at a Cheech and Chong concert. My mom was on a date with my dad's best friend. <laughs>